One last thing to do with regard to the simple harmonic oscillator. Let's look at expectation values. Let's look at the expectation values for position and momentum, but also let's look at the uncertainties in those values. And we're going to bring it all around, tie it all up, and show that, as you might hope, out pops the Heisenberg uncertainty principle for when we consider the uncertainties in position and momentum for the various states. We're also going to use bracket notation again, just so I can hammer home. It's a much more compact notation. It's a language, you have to get used to using that language, but as you're about to see, it can make life a lot easier in terms of the amount of writing we have to do um, when solving these types of problems. With regard to determining expectation values, we start with our lowering and our raising operator and we add them together. Do this yourself and what you'll find is you end up with a very simple result, which is that, which in turn we can just flip around so that we get expression for our position operator. Uh, let me put it at the front. Which looks like that. Now we're gonna express, we're gonna exploit the real elegance of the ladder operators moving us up and down that ladder. Also the fact that we've got a, a, our basis states orthogonal to do this, to, to work out the expectation value without going anywhere near an integral. So what's our expectation value for position? Our expectation value for position is our usual bracket. <laughs> Not that. That. Where we're using n, just n, to label the energy eigenstates. So n equal to 0, n equal to 1, n equal, n equal to 2, etc. So we've just worked out what our position operator is in terms of the raising and lowering operators. Which is that. Which in turn we can write like, we can just break up. Uh, let's do it this way. Take the constant outside. We can break this up. Okay, that's not particularly clear writing. Okay, that's not particularly clear writing, but then is my writing ever clear? Via the magic of Cantasia. Let's think about this. Lowering operator pulls us down one step to another eigenfunction. That eigenfunction is orthogonal to the original um, function. So what we have here is the inner product of an end state and an n minus 1 state, that's 0. Similarly, when we use the raising operator, we go from an n state to an n plus 1 state, whose dot product is also going to be 0. So our expectation value for position is 0 for all states, done. Not one integral. That's the power of thinking in terms of dot products and thinking in terms of bras and kets and in thinking in terms of matrix mechanics. I believe that Mustafa has been at pains as well during the various workshops and various sessions over the course of the last semester to just put across that really, there's not a great deal of mathematics involved in quantum mechanics sometimes. There's a key point there with regard to once we have the concepts right in our head, an awful lot of the mathematics becomes trivial in the sense that it can almost be done by inspection or as we saw in this case it can be done by inspection and obviously it's a big conceptual leap to go from writing down those expectation value integrals to thinking about in terms of dot products inner products to thinking about in terms of browser kits and to go that next step but ultimately in terms of the intuition and language of quantum mechanics that's what we're aiming for it's not mathematical complexity as such in terms of 40 pages of solving some fiendishly awful set of differential equations. It's this type of mathematics, this type of elegant, compact mathematics. What I want you to do, and it's a check your understanding question in the notes as well, is apply that same type of reasoning to the expectation value for momentum. 
the expectation value for momentum and you will find that you get exactly the same result that the expectation value for position for all the eigenstates is zero the expectation value for, for momentum for all the eigenstates is zero that obviously doesn't mean that the particle is sitting there motionless get that idea straight out of your head the expectation value may well be zero that doesn't mean that there's no dynamics there let's think about what the uncertainty in the position, what the variance in the, in the position and the variance in the momentum might be. And out is going to pop, as I've said a number of times now, Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So what we're going to calculate are these quantities. So the expectation values for square of um, position and momentum. So what we have are effectively mean square values. And you, you've seen this, you've done this before in terms of calculating the expectation value integrals directly uh, on one of the previous worksheets, four or five, I can't remember, but round about then. Um, we're now again going to do it in terms of bracket notation so you can contrast and compare and see how bracket notation really allows us to, we don't have to calculate one integral, really. Okay, the first thing we need to do is to show that the commutator for our raising and lowering operators is equal to one. Make sure you can do this. You, you can accept this for now in terms of everything else I'm going to do, but you should try and work it out for yourself. Okay, now we can write this. And if you don't see where that comes from, go back to this question on this worksheet, just to see why that's the case. And in turn, we can write this, so we're squaring this. So we've got one over root two times one over root two. And this is the sum of our raising, uh, of our lowering and raising operators. So again, oh sorry, and that's squared. And if we multiply that out, we get this. Same arguments again, except now we're doing the raising or lowering operator twice in a row. So instead of going to n minus one or n plus one, we're going to the n minus two or n plus two eigen function, eigen ket. Doesn't matter, they're still all orthogonal to each other. So exactly the same arguments that if we take the um, bracket of the nth state with the n minus two state, n minus tooth state, um, it's going to be zero. So they fall out. That means we're just left with these terms. Now, we use the commutator we had at the start. And let's think about what that commutator means. So we, we, we did that commutator a couple of minutes ago. So the commutator of the raising and lowering operators is equal to one. What's the commutator mean? Well, then what we have is that minus that is equal to 1. In terms of that quantity in brackets down here, we can write this as and then if we insert that in there, right, so there's one final new operator I'm afraid I have to introduce and that's called the number operator. And the number operator is actually this thing. And what the number operator, sorry, what the number operator returns is actually the number, <laughs> hence the name number operator, in that if we have the number operator operating in a ket n, it returns n times that ket. Moreover, remember from our definition of the Hamiltonian, that we can, which was this plus a half, and then we can now write that in terms of the number operator. And this simple mathematical relationship between the two means that the Hamiltonian and the number operator commute. You can do the commutator and see that they commute. You can see that it's equal to zero. That means they share common eigenfunctions, eigenkets. So when this is a, when we're talking about a, a state n here, for as an eigenstate of the number operator, that's the same as an eigenstate of the um, Hamiltonian. 
So we're talking about the same states. So if we put that in in turn, what we get, which in turn, given that this operates on and returns the eigen um, ket times n, what we end up with, oh, let me move it up the board. What we end up with is that, that's one. So delta x squared is a very simple result, which is uh, n plus a half. Remember we're in natural units. We'll plug in proper units in a second, but we're in natural units at the moment. Turns out that similar, well, identical arguments for uncertainty in P give us exactly the same result. Follow the same arguments I've used for position to work out this quantity for momentum and you'll see that you get n plus a half too. Okay. So if we take the product of delta x by delta p, we get n plus a half, square root of this by square root of this. That's in, as I said, in natural units. So what we have in actual units, well, remember that our unit for length was um, so natural units. Can we see that? Uh, just about, let me move it back. In terms of traditional units, what we have, uh, and this was um, m h bar omega zero times n plus a half again. That goes, that goes, that goes. Root h bar by root h bar gives us n plus a half h bar. So delta x, delta p is equal to n plus a half h bar. Note, for n equal to zero, i.e. the ground state, i.e. a pure Gaussian eigenfunction, we get what's called the minimum uncertainty. So delta x, delta p is half h bar. That's, we can't do better than that, because n is going to increase by blocks of one, units of one. So that means... which is our Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And for reasons we're not going to, Gaussian gives us the minimum uncertainty. Gaussian wave function gives us that minimum uncertainty. That's why for n equal to zero, we can get h bar over two. It all ultimately goes back to, to Fourier transforms and you've, you've looked at Fourier transform and Gaussians one to the other. And the minimum uncertainty we can get is for a Gaussian, Gaussian wave function. Right. This was the penultimate video. Next video is the last video for the quantum world, semester one. And the last, the next video and the final video is going to be bringing it everything full circle. So we started off comparing the classical and quantum worlds. We're going to go back as we as I finish this off to compare the classical and quantum worlds and particularly with regard to conservation law and particular conservation laws and particular regard to symmetry. But most importantly of all, the next video is going to feature Motorhead.